As we delve into the tragic story of the Titanic, one cannot help but feel a sense of unease. The idea of a magnificent ship sinking to the depths of the ocean, taking with it the lives of thousands of passengers, is a haunting and harrowing tale. For years, we've only had a few photographs to capture the essence of this fateful journey. But what if we told you that we have uncovered something truly remarkable? Real photos of the Titanic and its passengers have been discovered revealing the faces of those who boarded the ship with hope and excitement, only to meet a heartbreaking end. Join us as we explore these photos and take a closer look at the events that shook the world to its core. Here now are 12 photos of the Titanic and its passengers. Number 12. The Magnificent Ship The first picture shows the Titanic as the magnificent work of art that it was, the architecture and building of the Titanic were a marvel of engineering and design that still captivates people's imaginations to this day. The ship would be conceived as the ultimate in luxury and comfort, and no expense was spared in its construction. It was designed to be the largest and most opulent ship in the world. Its exterior was a work of art with graceful curves and lines that gave it a sense of elegance and beauty. It was also equipped with cutting-edge technology, which included the ability to generate over 46,000 horsepower and reach speeds of up to 23 knots. The construction of the Titanic would be a massive undertaking, involving thousands of workers, both skilled and unskilled, and its frame was made of over 3 million rivets, which were used to fasten the steel plates that formed its hull and structure. The designers also implemented a revolutionary system of watertight compartments that were designed to keep it afloat even in the event of a breach. Despite the titanic size and complexity, it would be built with an incredible level of attention to detail. Every aspect of its design was carefully considered, from the placement of the lifeboats to the layout of the cabins. Unfortunately though, the titanic's legacy would be marred by tragedy when it struck an iceberg and sank on its maiden voyage in 1912, resulting in the loss of over 1,500 lives. But even in the face of disaster, the architecture and building of the Titanic remain a testament to the human spirit of innovation and creativity, along with being a reminder of the incredible achievements that can be accomplished when we push the boundaries of what is possible. Number 11. The Grand Staircase If you've seen the movie, then you may recall The Grand Staircase. It's where Jack waits for Rose on multiple occasions in the movie and the intricate golden design of the staircase isn't one that can easily be forgotten. The grand staircase of the Titanic was a sight to behold, a true testament to the craftsmanship and ingenuity of the ship's designers and builders. This architectural masterpiece was the heart of the ship, spanning across multiple decks and serving as a symbol of the luxurious and extravagant lifestyle that the Titanic promised to its passengers. The staircase would be made of the finest of materials, adorned in intricate carvings and topped with magnificent glass dome that allowed natural light to flood the area. The first class passengers would descend the grand staircase in their finest attire, eager to attend lavish dinners and parties. Meanwhile, the second and third class passengers would use the staircase as a means of getting to their designated areas, marveling at the beauty of their surroundings. Even the crew members who worked tirelessly to ensure a smooth operation of the ship would catch a glimpse of the grand staircase as they went about their duties. It was a reminder that, despite the class differences upon board, they were all part of something truly remarkable. Tragically though, the grand staircase was lost when the Titanic sank to the depths of the ocean, but its legacy lives on, a testament to the grandeur and splendor of a bygone era. Number 10. The Main Dining Room this was yet another place that was showcased in the movie where most of the ship's passengers dined. As you entered the main dining room, you would be greeted with a breathtaking sight. The room was enormous with towering pillars and intricately carved decorations that spoke of the ship's superior craftsmanship. The tables were adorned with white tablecloths, fine china, sparkling silverware, and the room was bathed in the soft glow of electric chandeliers. The main dining room would be a place where passengers could indulge in the finest of delicacies that were prepared by the ship's top chefs. From delicate hors d'oeuvres to decadent desserts, every dish was carefully crafted. The room would be alive with the sounds of chatter and laughter as passengers sipped on the finest of wines and cocktails and savored the exquisite dishes. 
Despite the class divisions on board the Titanic, the main dining room became a place where everyone was equal. First class passengers dined in the same room as second and third class, and the elegance and sophistication of the room were there for all to appreciate. Sadly, the main dining room now rests at the bottom of the ocean floor after the Titanic tragically sank and met its defeat. Number 9. Margaret Brown We'll now talk about some of the real passengers that boarded the Titanic. Margaret Brown, also known as the unsinkable Molly Brown, was a real person on the Titanic who was also a character in the film. But who was she before the tragedy of the boat? Margaret Brown grew up in a small home that was located close to the Mississippi River. In the summer of 1886, she would meet James Joseph Brown, whose parents had immigrated from Ireland, and they were married in 1886. The couple had two children named Lawrence and Catherine, and at the age of 45, Margaret boarded the Titanic in France after making a significant impact on the world. She was one of the first women to run for political office in the United States, even though women did not have the right to vote at the time. Margaret had been traveling in Europe and stayed with John Jacob Astor's party in Cairo, Egypt, when she received news that her grandson was sick. That's when she decided to leave for New York immediately and booked passage upon the Titanic. After the ship hit the iceberg, Margaret helped to load others into lifeboats and eventually had to board lifeboat number six. She worked with other women in the lifeboat to row and maintain morale. After a long and difficult life, she then passed away in October of 1932 from a brain tumor while working with young actresses in New York. She would be buried beside her husband James in Holy Rood Cemetery on Long Island after a simple funeral service. You see, Margaret Brown was not only a hero on the Titanic, but in real life as well. Number 8. Joseph Bruce Ismay you may remember the character of Joseph Bruce Ismay from the Titanic film. Portrayed by Jonathan Hyde, he was shown to be a mean guy who voted to move the Titanic at an elevated speed, which would cause it to crash into the iceberg. But some say that's not how the real story went. Joseph would be born in 1862 near Liverpool to parents Thomas and Margaret. His father was a senior partner in Ismay, Emery & Company and the founder of the White Star Line. He would be educated at Harrow and then went on to France for a year to be tutored before being apprenticed into his father's office for four years. After traveling the world for some time, he was then posted to New York and appointed the company agent for White Star Line after a year. In 1888, he would marry Julia Shefflin and they had four children. They then returned to England in 1891 and Joseph became a partner at his father's firm. After his father died in 1899, Joseph then took over the business. In 1907, Joseph met Lord Peary of Harlan & Wolfe to discuss the White Star Line's response to other recently launched marvels of big boats in the Canard Line, and that's when they planned to build a new type of ship, one that would be both fast and luxurious with a large steerage capacity. They ended up building three ships, with the RMS Titanic being the second and the White Star Line's pride and joy. And this is where life took a sharp turn. On the 10th of April 1912, he would board the Titanic with his valet Richard Fry and his secretary William Henry Harrison. What began as an exciting adventure would soon turn into an absolute nightmare, and Joseph saw what he had created sink right in front of his eyes with 1,500 people aboard. But he was able to survive the sinking of the Titanic and then went on to provide testimony during a U.S. Senate inquiry into the tragedy. Following the disaster, he also faced severe criticism from the media for having saved himself instead of prioritizing the safety of women and children who remained aboard the ship. Throughout the rest of his life, he launched the cadet ship Mercy to train officers for Britain's Merchant Navy and would be finally laid to rest on the 17th of October 1937, leaving behind a tragic legacy. Number 7. William McMaster Murdoch William Murdoch was another real passenger who was portrayed in the film in a negative light. The truth about his role, however, was much different than what was shown in the movie. The story of William Murdoch begins in Scotland, where he was born into a family of seafarers. His father and grandfather were both sea captains, as were several of his grandfather's brothers. Following in their footsteps, he was then apprenticed into a shipping company in Liverpool 
After completing school, despite being only four years into his apprenticeship, Murdoch was so skilled that he actually passed his second mate certificate on his first attempt. He then worked as a first mate on St. Cuthbert until it sank in a hurricane off of Uruguay in 1897. After gaining his extra master certificate in Liverpool, he then began serving as an officer for the White Star Line in the year 1900. Over the next 12 years, he would work his way up the ranks, serving on a series of White Star Line vessels. He would then return to the RMS Olympic until December of 1911, and that was when he would be assigned to be chief officer on the Titanic, the Olympic's sister ship. However, the Titanic's maiden voyage would prove to be tragic. On the night of April 14, 1912, the ship would claim the life of Murdoch, amongst many others. Despite being hailed as a hero for his efforts to save passengers during the disaster, Murdoch's legacy has been somewhat overshadowed by controversy along with speculation about his actions in the moments that led up to its sinking. The 1997 film would portray his character as having committed suicide after the ship struck the iceberg. After the film would air, a memorial fund was created in Murdoch's hometown as the residents there objected to the depiction of him in the film. The film's director James Cameron denied any negative intentions toward Murdoch, but he acknowledged that portraying a specific person may have been a mistake. In 2012, Premier Exhibitions identified his belongings, which included a toiletry kit with his initials, a spare White Star Line officer's button, a straight razor, a shoe brush, a smoking pipe, and a pair of long johns which were all recovered from the wreckage of the Titanic in 2000. Even years after the ship has sank, remnants of its legacy were fetched from the depths of the water and brought back to the memory of William Murdoch. Number 6. Ida and Isidore Strauss The next two passengers might have the most sad story of the shipwreck. Isidore and Ida Strauss were a real-life couple who inspired one of the most tragic scenes in the movie. They were both of Jewish descent, born on February 6th, and had emigrated from Germany to America. In 1871, the two were married and had seven children together. Isidore worked for his father's business, which eventually integrated into the glass and china department at Macy's. He became a co-owner of the entire Macy's chain, whereas Ida was a housewife and a busy mother. The two were very much in love, and whenever Isidore traveled for business, they wrote to each other faithfully. Unaware that the Titanic would bring an end to their love, the couple boarded the ship and were assigned to cabin C-55. When the ship began to sink and utter mayhem spread throughout, as people ran for their lives, Isidore and Ida made no attempt to escape the ship and simply chose to die together. They gave their new maid, Ellen Bird, Ida's long mink fur coat to keep her warm and make sure that she secured a spot on the lifeboat. As the lifeboats were being loaded, Isidore and Ida Strauss were offered seats on separate lifeboats. However, Ida refused to leave her husband and instead gave up her seat to a younger woman who was traveling alone. Isidore as well would refuse to board a lifeboat until every woman and child would be evacuated. The last time that anyone saw them, they were sitting side by side on deck chairs while the ship continued to sink. Eventually, the ocean swallowed them up, and upon being rescued from her lifeboat, Ellen Bird relayed the devotion of Isidore and Ida, and it resonated with people all throughout the world. The legacy of this couple does live on, and there is a memorial statue of them in New York City. Number 5. The Dean Family Next up we have the Dean Family, some of the few lucky ones to have survived the tragedy. Bertram and Eva Dean were a young couple with their whole lives ahead of them when they decided to leave their home in London and board the Titanic. Bertram was a businessman who saw promise in the United States, and Eva was eager to start a new life with her husband and young child. The Deans purchased second-class tickets for their journey from Southampton to New York, paying £13 each for both themselves and a reduced rate of £3 for their two-year-old son, Bertram Jr. The family was excited about the journey ahead of them and spent their first days on the ship exploring its luxurious amenities, which included fine dining and entertainment. However, everything changed when the Titanic struck an iceberg and began to sink, plunging its passengers into chaos and confusion. When the Titanic collided with the iceberg, Bertram was immediately alerted to the danger 
He quickly left his cabin to investigate and later returned to inform his wife that they needed to get their sleeping child dressed and up on deck. The family made their way to a lifeboat with Bertram holding on to Bertram Jr. As the lifeboat was lowered into the icy waters, they would watch in horror as the Titanic sank below the surface. The Deans were lucky to have made it onto one of the lifeboats and to have survived the disaster. The family would later be reunited with Bertram Jr.'s nanny, who had also survived, and they settled in Wichita, Kansas. There, Bertram found success in business, and the family worked to move on from the tragedy that they had experienced. Bertram Jr. had never spoken publicly about his experience on the Titanic, but his daughter, Eleanor Dean, later became a vocal advocate of the Titanic's safety and preservation. She believed that the tragedy of the boat served as a cautionary tale for future generations, highlighting the importance of safety and preparedness on the seas. The story of the Dean family is just one of many, showcasing the bravery and resilience of those who were on board. Bertram Frank Dean may not be in the photograph, but it was thanks to his quick thinking that the family woke up and boarded that lifeboat. He serves as an example of a true hero in the story of the Dean family. Number 4. Wallace Henry Hartley Wallace Henry Hartley was a musician with a passion for music that went far beyond just playing the notes, and he proved his love for music until his last dying breath. Hartley was a man who believed that music had the power to uplift and inspire, and he dedicated his life to sharing that message with the world. He was a member of the ship's orchestra on the Titanic, a group of musicians who were hired to provide entertainment for the passengers during the voyage. He played the violin and was known for his skill and love of music. When the Titanic struck an iceberg and began to sink, Hartley and his fellow musicians did not hesitate to perform their duties. They continued to play their instruments even as chaos and panic gripped the ship. They knew that their music could provide comfort and solace to the passengers and crew, and they were determined to fulfill that role to the very end. In the movie Titanic, we see Hartley and his fellow musicians playing on the deck of the ship surrounded by the sounds of creaking metal and crashing waves. They play a hauntingly beautiful melody, their instruments echoing across the water and into the night sky. Tragically though, Hartley and his fellow musicians did not survive the sinking. They went down with the ship, their instruments still in hand, and even though they were not ordered to do what they did for the passengers, they went on and did it anyway, which shows their love for music and their sacrifice. They were not much of a help, but they tried to help in the only way that they knew how. Number 3. John Jacob Astor IV John Jacob Astor IV and his wife Madeline were a newly wedded couple who were not fated to live a life together. Astor was a man of immense wealth and privilege, but he was also one of great ambition and innovation. He was a visionary entrepreneur, a prolific writer, and a passionate advocate for new ideas and technology. On the Titanic, he would be traveling with his pregnant wife Madeline on their way back from a honeymoon in Europe. As one of the wealthiest passengers on board, he would be given the royal treatment, enjoying the finest amenities and luxuries that the ship had to offer. But as the ship began to sink, Astor's wealth and status were of little use to him. Instead, he would find himself facing the same challenges and dangers as everyone else on board. In the film Titanic, we see Astor and his wife struggling to make their way to safety, braving the chaos and confusion that engulfed the ship. Tragically, he did not survive the sinking of the Titanic and went down with the ship, leaving behind a legacy of innovation and forward thinking that would continue to shape the world for generations to come. Despite his untimely death, Astor's impact on the world does live on, from his pioneering work in the field of science fiction to his contributions to the world of real estate and finance, he remains a symbol of the power and innovation along with creativity in the face of adversity. The story of John Jacob Astor IV is a reminder that no matter how wealthy or powerful a person may be, we are all vulnerable to the forces of nature along with the uncertainties of life. Number 2. Thomas Andrews Do you remember Thomas Andrews in the film? Rose runs into him while the ship is sinking. Thomas Andrews felt that his ship had failed the thousands of souls upon board the ship that night, even though it was not his fault that it collided with the iceberg. Thomas Andrews was a man of incredible skill and talent, known for his work as a shipbuilder and naval architect. He would be born in County Down, Ireland in 1873 and grew up surrounded by the shipbuilding industry. 
His father was a prominent shipbuilder, and Andrews himself began working in the industry at a young age. He would quickly rise through the ranks, earning a reputation for his attention to detail, along with his ability to design ships that were both elegant and functional. He became the managing director of Harlan and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where he oversaw the construction of some of the world's most famous vessels. One such vessel would be the Titanic, which Andrews played a critical role in designing. He was deeply involved in the ship's construction, overseeing every detail of the process to ensure that the vessel was not only beautiful, but also safe and sturdy. Despite his efforts, tragedy would strike the night of April 14, 1912, when it struck an iceberg and began to sink. Andrews quickly assessed the damage, realizing that the ship was doomed. But instead of trying to save himself, he would turn his attention to helping others, assisting with the evacuation of passengers and doing everything in his power to minimize the loss of life. As the ship went down, Andrews would last be seen in the first-class smoking room, staring at a painting on the wall. His selflessness and bravery in the face of such a disaster were widely recognized, and he's remembered to this day as being a hero. Number 1. Captain Edward Smith The captain always goes down with the ship. Captain Edward Smith was a man of great experience and reputation, known throughout the world as one of the finest captains of his time. He had a long and storied career at sea, having served as the captain of numerous vessels before taking the helm of the Titanic. In the movie, we see Captain Smith portrayed as a calm and collected figure with a deep sense of responsibility for the safety of his passengers and crew. He's shown walking through the ship's grand dining room, taking note of the elegance and luxury of the vessel, and later discussing the ship's speed and safety with his officers. On the night of the collision, Captain Smith was immediately alerted to its danger and worked tirelessly to coordinate the ship's evacuation. He would give orders to launch the lifeboats and ensure that women and children were given priority in the evacuation process. In one memorable scene from the film, we see Captain Smith standing on the bridge of the ship as it begins to go down. He looks out over the chaos and devastation, fully aware of the magnitude of the tragedy that's unfolding around him. Despite his best efforts, there were not enough lifeboats to save everyone on board, and many lives would perish. In the end, Captain Smith went down with his ship, and his memory looms over the corridors of the Titanic resting at the bottom of the ocean, along with all of those other lost souls.